Psalm 139, 1 to 18, TPT version. I read quickly. It says, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul. And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. And you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. I don't know if you have been in situations where you are trying to explain how you feel to someone. And there is no words. You don't have the words. But scripture is telling us here that before you even begin to think about those words, he himself knows what is in your heart that you want to say. And it's amazing that when we, when we now want to pray to this same God, we begin to look for words to craft to pray to him. You are looking for scriptures to combine together. You are looking for eloquent words that you put together to craft together, to speak to a God that knows your thoughts even before they get to you. He says, you read my heart like an open book and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. So whatever it is that you are facing, he's aware of it. Because it's in front of you and it's behind you. So nothing is coming to you that he is unaware of. You've gone into my future to prepare the way and in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You have laid your hand on me. This is just too wonderful, deep and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I run and hide from your face? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you are there too. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you are there. If I fly into the radiant sunsets, you are there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me. For your presence is everywhere, bringing lights into my night. There is no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the day. There is no difference between the two. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. Everything concerning you, the good, the bad, the ugly, is woven together and is mysteriously complex and marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, 
the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you are thinking of me, how precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you are still with me. Hallelujah. He says, how thoroughly you know me, O oh Lord. I don't know what your prayers are this morning, what's your concerns, what issues you may be going through. What is in your heart that you've been trying to communicate to people and nobody seems to understand? He says he knows your thoughts before they ever reached you. I want you to bow down your head this morning and thank him for loving you marvelously. I want you to appreciate him for the depths of your hearts and say, Father, thank you for intricately weaving everything that concerns me together. Thank you for loving me marvelously. Thank you for loving me. And I want you to express your concerns and your worries. What it is that is troubling you. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you this morning. And say to you, the devil will whisper in your ears and say, you prayed this prayer yesterday now. Did God answer? I remember asking God the same thing. I said, God, the one I prayed, did you answer? And God said to me, he said, your business is to pray in faith. My business is to answer. Leave my business to me. So you made a prayer yesterday. It seemed as if it wasn't answered. And the devil is telling you today, don't bother praying. And God is saying to you, your business, your own assignment is to pray in faith. His own business is to answer. Leave his business to him. Don't work out his own business with yours. Your own business and assignment is to pray in faith. He said, ask and I will answer you. That is an assurance. I will answer you. You are tired of asking. You are tired of praying. You are tired of seeking his face. You are tired of depending on him. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for the thoughts that you have for us. Thank you because they are thoughts of good and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. Thank you for the grace to be able to come into your presence every minute and every second. To enjoy your presence. To enjoy your fellowship. To come with the ability to speak to you. Knowing you know already our thoughts from afar off. Even as we ask in faith all the things we desire in you. Knowing that your own business is to answer while ours is to ask. Lord, we present our requests and our thoughts to you. And we ask that greater things than we have asked, Lord, you will do. And Lord, we commit today into your hands. Thank you for how far you have brought us from the missionary force even up until now. And I ask that, Lord, you will take the stage. You will speak through me. You will speak to your children and you will cause a transformation and a translation of their souls and of their spirits in the mighty name of Jesus. We welcome you into our midst. Dear Father, we ask that, Lord, you saturate the space with your power, with your presence. In Jesus' most precious name we have prayed. Amen, amen and amen. All right, please let's be seated. Good morning and God bless you. 
All right, please say to your neighbor, welcome to God's citadel. Now, wow, you people are doing as if you are fighting this morning. Welcome to God's citadel. Welcome to your citadel. To my citadel. To our citadel. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right, so quickly let us launch into the business of today. Um, I said here that so far so good. It's been an unusual year for me. And I want to believe that in this year of unusual and uncommon elevation, God has been ministering to you and to me. Every Sunday and every time we have met at the CGC since the beginning of this year, of unusual and uncommon elevation. There has been rich truths and rich revelation coming from this podium. Can I have anybody testify to that? God has deliberately been enriching our lives with the truths from the throne room of heaven. And you know, to now like make things even deeper or to remind us of where he wants us to be. He again, you know, taught us or led us to being, not being mere men, sorry. <clears throat> to drive on the point that God wants us to experience an unusual elevation this year. He has again drawn our attention to the fact that you and I are not mere men. I wrote here, I said he has invested so much in us this year. And my prayer is that our lives will yield great returns on investments to him. God has blessed us with rich truths, fresh bread from heaven, Sunday after Sunday, through many ministers who have come up on this podium. And he's not doing it just for doing sake. There is a purpose in mind to ensure that you and I, our lives are no longer the same. That we experience truly what it means to have unusual and uncommon elevation. That while others are saying there is a casting down, we can boldly say there is a lifting up. And based on that, again, like I said, he gave us a reality of who we are. We are more than who we think we are. We are not men. men. And so our prayer, truly, is that God will benefit from us that he will yield something on his investment. I mean, if you are putting something on something, are you not expecting returns on the investment? So if he has been investing in us in the past 35 years, and more especially this year, my prayer is that our lives will not be the same again. That we'll be able to yield an investment to glorify God. There's this song that has been going on in my head. Turn that to a prayer point as you bow down your head. Lord, we present our lives to you. 
that our lives will glorify you. Every seed you have planted in us, Lord, will germinate to fruition in the name of Jesus. You will look down from heaven and you will be pleased with what you see. Because our lives and everything we'll do will give you pleasure. In Jesus' most precious name we have prayed. Amen. Thank you. So during the summits, when pastor taught on the guided tour of the crucibles by which real men are forged, one of the statements that stood out for me was, whether we liked it or not, God would forge real men out of his children by making them pass through crucibles. And one of the scriptures pastor shared was Psalm 66. And I would like for us to begin to read from verse 8 to verse 12 from three versions of the Bible. That's the TPT, the Message, and the New King James Version. Thank you. Psalm 68, 66, verse 8 to 12. TPT says, praise God, all you peoples. Praise him everywhere. And let everyone know you love him. There is no doubt about it. God holds our lives safely in his hands. He is the one who keeps us faithfully following him. Oh Lord, we have passed through your fire. <laughs> I mean, I was wondering the jump from that nice scripture. How did we come from? You are praising God, his people, all you peoples, his people. He's saying, praise God. Praise him everywhere. Let everyone know you love him. And you are there singing and you are praising and you are happy. And he says there is no doubt about it. God holds your life safely in his hands. And he says he's the one who keeps us faithfully following him. And you are like, wow, he keeps me safely in his hands. And the next thing is, oh Lord, we have passed through your fire. It's part of the following. And that was why pastor said, whether you like it, or not, we will pass through what? We will pass through the crucible. He's not asking for your permission or my permission for as long as you are called his own. He says, we have passed through your fire like precious metal made pure. You have proved us, perfected us, and made us holy. You've captured us and sneered us in your net. Then, like prisoners, you placed chains around the neck of your children. Imagine, just think about it. You've allowed our enemies to prevail against us. We've passed through fire and flood. Yet in the end, you always bring us out better than we were before. Saturated with your goodness. That's typity. The other version says... Bless our God, O oh peoples. You know, excitement. Give him a thunderous welcome. See them now. Give him a thunderous welcome. <laughs> and he says, didn't he set us on the road to life? Didn't he keep us out of the ditch? He trained us first. He passed us like silver through refining fires and brought us into hard scrabble country, pushed us to our very limits, road tested us inside and out, took us to hell and back. Finally, he brought us to this what? Well-watered place. As I read through this, something came to mind. And I said, you want to ask any athletes, or any professional, maybe ballet dancer or a tennis player, that that morning that they are going to court, they should wear, the, wear a brand new tennis shoe. Is it possible? No. Or you see Serena Williams, that morning that she wants to go and play Grand Slam, she will buy a new racket and use it. It cannot work. So if athletes that are on earth have the mind and the brain to know that they cannot use untested vessels. They will not use untested shoes. Shoe like peo butter, lason lason. How much more do you think God will not test you before He will use you?
the athletes will make sure they use their shoes because the shoe must align with their feet. They call it breaking of the shoe. They break the shoe. The athletes will make sure that that racket aligns with her palms. And so they call it breaking. God will make sure that your will aligns with his will. So it's not that he hates us when we go through our crucible. He loves us. But crucible, we must go through. NKJV says, Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who keeps our soul among the living? and does not allow our feet to be moved. <laughs> he does not do what? Allow our feet to be moved. And the same God that does not allow your feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But you brought us out to what? To reach fulfillment. He has brought us out. He will bring us out to reach fulfillment. So irrespective of what you are going through now, I want us to please keep the end in view. Irrespective of the crucible you might be in at the moment, Keep the end in view. There is what? A rich fulfillment. But aside from keeping the end in view, also keep the process in view. There is a purpose for the stripping. <laughs> there is a purpose for what? For the stripping. And I wrote here, I said there is only one candidate that is recorded in the Bible. Who cannot be refined? Just one. That one person is in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 21 to 22. He says the refining pot is for silver. Abi? And the furnace is for what? Gold. And a man is valued by what others say of him. So when he's saying that the crucible that we are going to go through or you are currently going through is for silver and for gold to refine you. He said, but if you grind a what? A fool in mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. May we not be foolish in Jesus' name. May we not pass through our crucible and just live and be like, and not gain anything from the experience. Only a fool will go through that will be crushed, will be crushed. And his folly will not depart from him. We've gone through 35 years of being taught, of being refined by the word of God in this house. And some of us, the same character that we exhibited 35 years ago, we are still exhibiting it now. It is called foolishness. I didn't say so. The Bible says so. So this week and next week, by the grace of God, we are going to take a look together at the topic, our pathway to reach fulfillment. Our pathway to reach fulfillment. As we consider a character in the Bible who defied menace, in quotes, she went through her own crucible, Rode against all odds to an unusual and uncommon elevation and to a rich fulfillment. This week, by the grace of God, we will look at the attributes that we should possess on the pathway to rich fulfillment. And next week, by the grace of God, we will look at the minds to avoid on the pathway to rich fulfillment as God helps us in Jesus' name. 
So quickly, let's open to the book of Esther. We'll be looking at the character Esther. But if you use your, um, what do you call it? If you don't use your Bible, you'll not get what I want us to get from here. It is the introduction to the book of Esther that our lessons will begin from. So if you have your Bible, open to the introduction to the book of Esther. And it says, God's hand of providence and protection on behalf of his people is evident throughout the book of Esther. Though his name does not appear once, Haman's plot brings grave dangers to the Jews and is countered by the courage of beautiful Esther and the counsel of her wise cousin Mordecai, resulting in a great deliverance. The Feast of Purim becomes an annual reminder of God's faithfulness on behalf of his people. Hester Sibu's name was Hadassah, Myrtle. But a Persian name, Esther, was derived from the Persian word for star, that is Tara. The Greek title for this book is Esther, and the Latin title is Hester. So from the introduction parts of um, Esther, there are two things we are going to pick from there. And the first thing I want us to consider is the name that is upon you. The name that is what? Upon you. The first thing I took out from that introduction when I saw it was the two names, were the two names Esther and Hadassah. Esther and Hadassah. And from that introduction, we see what the meaning of Hadassah is. It says Hadassah means myrtle, you know, like the myrtle tree. So I got curious because, you know, the myrtle is mentioned about six times in the Bible. And if you look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 13, it says, 55 verse 13, thank you. It says, instead of the thorn shall come up the what? The cypress tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the what? The myrtle tree. So in a situation where the world expects to see thorns, to see droughts, to see pains that is typical with a wilderness, what you have is a beautiful and rich evergreen motto. So for Esther, we'll get to the place where we'll talk about her disadvantaged position. We are looking at a young girl who is obviously very disadvantaged. And then she's named Hadassah. She's given a name that is called Mato. And so she has a vision of herself. Multimedia, I think I sent two images to you, if you can please put it up there. She has this image of what her life should be. We just read in Hebrew, in, in um, Isaiah 55, that instead of what? The sun shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the metal tree. So from her name alone, Based on her circumstances, what she's feeling around her, she's in an unknown land, she's a stranger, she's a captive, she's poor, she does not have parents, she does not have anybody. What she feels around her is this, the briar, thorns. But what her name says to her is that she's what? She's beautiful. She's evergreen. So this is the vision she has for herself in spite of the situation that she has found herself because of the name that is upon her. Hadassah. What name is upon you? What name are we giving our children? Her parents are not here. But she has this picture in her heart that irrespective of the pain she's going through at the moment, her name has given her a vision of where she can be and what she can be. What name is upon you? So for Esther, the evergreen myrtle, you can put it down, thank you. 
The evergreen myrtle brings to mind Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 to 8, that says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruits. God knows that prayers cannot give him pleasure. We just prayed this morning that our lives will do what? Our lives will give him pleasure. And so because of the bride, he said, instead of the bride, you will do what? You will have myrtle. Because our life must give him pleasure. The question again is, what name is upon you? What name do you bear? Are you conscious of the name you carry? Does it speak to your identity or to your destiny? I said here, I said, if names were not important, Abraham would not become Abraham. Jacob will not become Israel. And Elare will not become what? It will not become the CGCC because it is in our name that we have what? Our assignments and our vision. We look at the importance of a name in Isaiah chapter 62, verses 2, verses 4, and verses 12. I will quickly read. It says, The Gentiles shall see your righteousness. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 2. And all kings your glory. You shall be called by what? By a new name. God knows the importance of a name upon you on this your pathway to reach fulfillment. The first thing that stood out for Esther was her name Hadassah. And God is saying to you, you shall be called what? By a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Verse 4 says, you shall no longer be termed forsaken. Nor shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beula. For the Lord does what? He delights in you, and your land shall be married. Verse 12 says, And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. The name you bear is important on this pathway to where you're headed. What name is upon you? To lend further credence to the importance of the name that is upon you and I, God again said to Moses in Numbers chapter 6 verse 27. He says, so they shall do what? They shall do what? They shall put my name on the children of Israel. And I will do what? I will bless them. Irrespective of what your name is, my own name is Olu Amodupe, and it speaks to me. But irrespective of what your name is, or what you have been called before now, today God's name is upon you, and his name will command blessings for you in Jesus' name. Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. It says, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. And it says, In every place where I record what? My name. I will come to you and I will bless you. What name is upon you? Are you conscious of God's name upon you? Have you called, of, called on God's name upon yourself and say like Jabez, irrespective of what my birth parents have called me, I am calling the name of God upon myself because the name of God will command blessings.
It says, then all the peoples of the earth, I'm reading Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 10. All peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they shall be what? They shall be afraid of you. Remember the story of Solomon when he was dedicating the temple. And he said after the temple had been completed, he asked God and said, wherever it is that your children are all over this world, we put your name upon this temple, wherever they may be, whether they're infirming in war because of their disobedience, when they call upon that name, arise and respond to them. And if you look at Jehoshaphat, I think that would be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles 20, I'll quickly open that. I didn't give that scripture before. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7 to 9. All right, so he says, are you not our God? This is Jehoshaphat. He says, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your father forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, oh, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. For your name is where? Is in this temple. And we will cry out to you in our what? Affliction. And you will do what? You will hear and save. Did God hear and save them? Did God hear and save them? Is God's name upon you? Are you conscious of the fact that God's name is upon you? And if God's name is upon you, what is poverty doing with you? What is affliction doing with you? I want us to bow our feet, I mean, bow our heads this morning and say, irrespective of what my name is, Lord, I thank you for the power in your name. I thank you for the benefits in your name. I thank you because your name upon me commands blessings. It chases out infirmities and sicknesses. It chases out everything that does not glorify you in my life. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Your name is your name. Breathe, Lord. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Breathe your name upon me. Just breathe your name upon me. We're having a baptism again this morning. Just Ask for a baptism of a fresh name upon you this morning. And ask that the Holy Spirit will breathe his name upon you. Lord, we receive a fresh baptism of your name in our lives and upon us in the mighty name of Jesus in Jesus most precious name we have prayed the name of the Lord is upon you and so I ask that going forward from today let us be conscious of it let us be conscious of that name that is upon us and not just be conscious, let us proclaim it the way Jehoshaphat proclaimed the name of God upon himself. Let us receive its benefits like it is in Numbers chapter 6. That God will bless us. What name is upon you? The name of the Lord is upon you. Hallelujah. 
So the second um, lesson to learn from the introduction into Esther is what is your character? What character do I have? The first one is what name do I have? On this journey, on this pathway to reach fulfillment, the name of the Lord is upon you and I. But now we are looking at our character. And I looked at a Persian name. The first one we looked at Hadassah. This one we are looking at Esther. And Esther, we know, is a Persian name that was given to her at the palace. But there was something I also read. It said history records that there was a certain grace and charm about Esther. There was something about her that attracted people to her. That was why they named her Star, Shining Star. And also scripture also records in Esther 2.15 that Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So both history and the Bible depict Esther as someone who is humble, someone who is obedient, someone who was dutiful, courageous, intelligent, powerful, and of course, she was beautiful. Proverbs 22, 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. I remember Pastor saying last week that our choices will lead to our becoming a spectator, a space holder, or a stakeholder. You can be sure that the absence of this kind of character in the life of Vashti made her become what? Like Pastor said to us last week, made her become a what? A space holder. And the presence of those character in the life of Esther made her a stakeholder. The question this morning again, like I asked before, when I said what name is upon you again, is what is your character? And what character are we raising our children by? From Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 26, we will not read that because of time. And 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 7, pastor had already showed to us during the summit the type of men that we ought to be. But I'll quickly read Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 15 in the TPT. Colossians 3, 12 to 15. It says, you are always and dearly loved by God. So robe yourself. The key word there is robe. The Holy Spirit has already finished his work in us. Pastor has preached and has overpreached his word. Our own responsibility now is to do what? To do. He says, robe yourself with virtues of God. Since you have been divinely chosen to be holy. Be merciful as you endeavor to understand others and be compassionate, showing kindness towards all. Be gentle and humble, unoffendable in your patience with others. Tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith, forgiving one another in the same way you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find fault with someone, release these same gifts of forgiveness to them, for love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues. Love becomes the mark of true maturity. Let your hearts be always guided by the peace of the anointed one who called you to peace as part of his one body and always be thankful. The key word there is what? Robe. If you check other translations at home, please do. You will know that the Holy Spirit has finished his work. It's time we, like I said earlier, become begotten. Let our will be aligned with God's will. So when I talked about the character, what character do you have? We know about the character of Jesus as it's ex exhibited in Galatians chapter 5, 5, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and all of that. But I want to bring it home to the CGCC. The least of the value we should possess in this house are the values that we were taught. I want to believe many of us have gone through the apostolic training school. The list of the values we should possess are the values we were taught at the ATS, which I will quickly highlight here. Our core value in the CGCC is leadership. 
And we have enough models in the Old Testament, the New Testament, we have even in the Now Testament, our pastor Tunde Bakari, to depict who a leader is. Our core value, each of us here is a leader. That is our core value as a member of the CGCC and should be our core character as a member of the house. As a leader, each of us should now have what? Compassion. That's one of the values and the characters of the CGCC member. What is compassion? Compassion is being born of love. It literally means to suffer together. If you have compassion, you're doing what? You are suffering together. You are, it's born of love. It means recognizing the suffering of others and then taking action to help. It's easy for us to help those who have not offended us. I mean, I, when I went through my own troubles and trials, a lot of us stood up and showed compassion. You rose up in your, in your tens and thousands and you showed compassion. But what about in a case where somebody has offended you? Is there like a minus? Is there something like a cross in that place that says show compassion only to those who have been kind to you? I ask the question. We have examples in the Bible of Joseph with what? With his brothers. He showed compassion to them even when he had power to trample on their head. We have example of Abraham and Lot. That one is even very interesting to me. I brought you from somewhere. I brought you to reach fulfillment. We got there. There is a strife. I said, choose. You choose something that's... Uh, uh, you know? No, choose that. We choose. No, you, you use your uju kokoro. And then you chose the better, seemingly looking better thing. And Abraham allowed him. And then he got into what? Into trouble. And they did what? They kidnapped him. They took him, abducted him. Amy, wale enye. It's your trouble. You ask for it. Four kings against five kings. They fought. And they were toppled. Then Abraham now went with how many soldiers that he trained in his house to go and fight for somebody that does not show me respect. Amy, bawo, how? But that was Compassion. And that's the kind of compassion that is expected of us as members of the CJCC. We need to show compassion. That is one vital value and one vital character that we must possess as leaders. The second one is intelligence. That ability to acquire knowledge and skills. Some people have defined stupidity as what? Doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result. So if we as a CGCC member should have intelligence, that is ability to acquire knowledge and skills, and you have opportunity to upgrade your skills and you're not making good use of it, and you want to get to reach fulfillment with the same attributes that you have since 35 years ago or since the beginning of the year, and you want to experience rich fulfillment, kolewako. We need to look inwards and trust God for creative grace. We are aware of the CGCC Tech Hub. Oh, am I correct, sir? Digitech Hub. How many of us have registered? Some of us are just hearing and listening, and we are praying for rich fulfillment. And you need this kind of intelligence and grace to function and to increase in abundance, but we are shrugging it off and like, well, it's not for me, I'm too old for it. Or it's not what I need. Responsibility is another vital value that a member of the CGCC should have. Are you responsive and accountable can I go to bed having given you an assignment? I know that you will move mountains before you give me an excuse. Can you? Are you responsible? Are you responsive? 
Are you accountable? Oh, won't bury me. I didn't come for my meeting last Sunday. Nobody noticed I was not there. And so me too, I'm not doing. No, that is not a value of the house. It is stated there that you must be what? Responsive. An instruction is given, you respond. And you are accountable. You are accountable to your leaders, you are accountable to your colleagues in that department, the ministry, or the units. You will not be available, please call someone. You will not be around, please tell someone. Show responsibility to any assignment given to you. Let me know, okay, I've given OJ an assignment. I can go to bed and go and sleep because I know that before he gives an excuse, he will move every mountain before he will give an excuse. That should be. If every one of us carried those values, CGCT will not be what we are experiencing today. There are other things that are still vital that we will continue next week. Sound judgment, punctuality, financial integrity. When we get to that place, maybe we will fight one another. Because we know what we know in this house about financial integrity. But for time's sake, we'll push this again till next week where we'll continue. Shall we bow down our heads and pray this morning? Shall we thank God for the word that we have received this morning? Shall we thank him for the seeds that has dropped in our hearts this morning? Shall we ask that we will not be like that man who looks in the mirror and just moves on, not remembering what he looked like in the mirror. Every word that has come from this stage, from this podium to us, is for our transformation, is for our translation, and is for our good. But it can only be transformational if we obey and we are deliberate about making changes in our lives. Shall we ask God for grace? That our lives will not be the same. The desire of God is that each of us becomes a headquarter of wealth. That is God's desire. Our assignment requires that each of us is a headquarter of wealth. But that will not happen if we remain in our soiled state, a state where our character is still embellished. Lord, we ask for your mercy upon us. We ask for a change in our character. We ask for grace to align our will with yours. We ask for your mercy upon us. In Jesus' most precious name we have prayed. We commit the service into your hands, dear Father. We ask for your presence, that your presence will be mightily felt, that you will speak through your vessel. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.